Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Uh, why don't we uh, begin in prayer, if you could please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. O Master, who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, how are you all doing tonight? Good. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing well. You know, we just had a wonderful program uh, on Sunday up in Loudoun County. You know, we're trying to grow that group up there. Um, I better talk about that because you're going to just be looking at the sisters the whole time, which are a lot more nice to look at than me. So... <laughs> <clears throat> Just a little announcement about our, 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 our sisters, the Magdala Apostolate. You've been seeing this cycling as long as it's actually working because it's been stopping. But we have uh, well over 60 sisters enrolled in our Magdala Apostolate this semester. Um, three classes being offered. You can see them there with the headsets on. Uh, we've been sending them also a wonderful new thing that just came out. Well, it's, it's new to us, and that is a central microphone and voice, uh, you know, however it works. It sucks your voice in and does the whole thing. Anyways, and uh, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make all this, all the, all the noise, um, which is a real problem when you're doing these programs and you have 12 or more communities joining in together. Sometimes there can be all sorts of problems. But our Magdal Apostle offers semester-long courses to the sisters for free online, uh, but not as a pre-recorded program. It's online, live where they can uh, speak with each other, they can participate in the class, they can ask the professor questions. Um, that's one of, our, one of our new sisters there trying to figure out her computer, so we took a picture of her. Um, but uh, a lot of really wonderful, wonderful sisters doing good work for the church, so um, I just thought I would kind of show that to you. You know, we didn't start the Magdal Apostolate too long ago, um, and it's just been amazing to see the growth that, that we've experienced uh, over that time. So... Um, I'll close that off and you guys can switch that over. Um, well, now you're going to watch them switch it over. So, um, And I had some other announcements. But yes, this is what it is. So don't look at that. Look at me. See? Okay. You, there, are, there are handouts tonight. So if you don't have a handout, I'm sorry. We did run out of maps. Um, but we do have another handout, which is kind of like a, a timeline chart. N neither of them I'm going to refer to tonight. These are for your own benefit uh, to take home. Uh, this is one man's attempt at putting together the chronological order of the life of Christ, which is not an easy task to do um, to figure out exactly. Isn't that a nice picture of the Sea of Galilee? Um, I took that picture. so um, uh, It's not an easy thing to do, but this is certainly one of, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best or the best attempts at uh, putting the life of Christ in a chronological order in such a way that one story kind of leads to the next. Um, and that's our goal over the next two weeks together, um, is to kind of put those things in order. Uh, I know our title is Driving Out Demons. No, I'm not going to be talking about Ouija boards. <laughs> All right? I know driving out demons tends to attract more people than Jesus. Um, but uh, So that's why I titled it Driving Out Demons. Um, but uh, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be walking with Christ on pilgrimage with Him together here at the Institute, uh, walking through Galilee and kind of seeing 
uh, where he's going, why he's going there, and what he's doing there. It's going to be a little unusual for me in the sense that I'm not going to be doing a lot of quoting from the church fathers. Uh, I have a few things to throw in there, uh, spiritual insights, but that's not my real goal in this, in this, uh, over these two weeks. My goal is to get you to be able to stand with Christ in Galilee. And know if you turn to your right or to your left, which direction you're turning, which city you're going to, uh, how far it's going to take you to walk to the water or to go up on the mountain to pray. Uh, You hear these stories in the scriptures and in mass constantly. We're always hearing, in fact, I think right now you're hearing about this time period of Christ up in Galilee. He's now been baptized Uh, We've celebrated the baptism of the Lord. We're heading to Lent, and can you believe only a few weeks? In fact, in our church, in the the Byzantine tradition, we began our preparation for Lent this Sunday, this past Sunday. I believe you guys begin next Sunday your kind of far preparation, gospel-wise. But you're hearing these stories of Christ and His ministry in Galilee, and and for me, they were always stories that were Wonderful stories that Jesus did these things. He drove out demons, uh, healed people, healed the paralytics, gave them sight. He walked on water. But I never could really see what he was doing. And when I started to be able to see that, uh, it made all the difference in the world. And now I was just speaking with somebody I went to the Holy Land with last year. I've been blessed to be able to go four times in the last five years. And I'm planning on going again in August. So... Um, but before I was able to see that, they were very distant stories about what Jesus did rather than being able to stand and see Jesus do those things. And so my goal over the next two weeks is to do that, to take um, uh, really the, mostly the two first journeys of Christ in Galilee um, and show you where he's going pictorially so that you can see where Capernaum is. Uh, you can see what it means to cross over to the other side. You can see where the Mount of Beatitudes is and what the apostles would have been looking at as Christ was speaking. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so that's our, that's our plan over the next two weeks to really uh, to take a pilgrimage with Christ in Galilee. I want to begin uh, by reading you a text from Genesis, which you don't have to turn there right now, but you can get your Bibles out. It's okay, but you don't have to turn to Genesis. Uh, because I'm going to piece some text together. And then after I quote the scriptures, I'm going to read to you a text I got from a, from a book that was about, a, I don't know, 90 years old. It was falling apart. And I found this beautiful meditation on Jerusalem in that book. And I have, uh, I have taken some poetic license, uh, applied it to Galilee for us tonight. Um, and I hope you appreciate it. So if you don't mind me kind of reading at you for a little bit, but just kind of drink it in. Listen and drink it in. Uh, and then we'll get to the, the slideshow and pull out our Bibles. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If you take the right, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley. So Lot chose for himself all of the Jordan Valley. And Lot journeyed east, and thus he separated himself from Abram. Abram dwelt in Canaan, while Lot dwelt among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. 
And St. Ephraim tells us that when Abram walked to the north, the south, the east, and the west, he walked the sign of the cross over the promised land. This is the story of our forefather Abraham when the Lord blessed him and gave him the Holy Land. This is the story that has been recalled by untold numbers of pilgrims who have approached the Holy Land when even from afar they first beheld its beauty. Then they stopped where they were and recollected themselves in fervent prayer and meditation. Before them and before us over the next two weeks is the Holy Land, the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, the Jordan, well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord. Here tradition tells us that our first parents were created and lived in paradise. Here Abram was called by the Lord and received the land as an inheritance. Here Solomon built the temple of God. And here after 70 years of exile, the people of God returned to the land promised them by the Lord. For this is the land preferred by God, which amidst a people blinded by error, steeped in idolatry, he sent his son, the Holy Land. It is holy to the Muslims. It is holy also to the Jews. But in a special way, it is the Holy Land of the Christians. For its earth was bathed in the blood of the Savior. Here he said, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here he was baptized at the hand of John. Here he vanquished the power of the evil one who tried to tempt him to sin. Here he healed the paralytic who was let through the roof of Peter's house. Here he walked on the water and saved his friends from the storms of this world. Here he multiplied the loaves and the fishes and fed the thousands who came to him. Here he revealed to his friends that he would feed them with everlasting life. Yes, truly it is a land which is holy, because, and, at, and because such, from the dawn of Christianity, pilgrims from every land of every tongue have come, enduring fatigue and discomfort, braving dangers, defying death itself to kiss the rock of Golgotha, to walk in the waters of Galilee, to bathe in the holy water of Jordan, and kiss the stone of the holy sepulcher with tears of love, truly to walk in the footsteps of God. Yes, this is the Holy Land, and thus we approach it not as any other place, not as the curious, the studious, the poet, or the artist. We approach it with a spirit of devotion. We approach it as Christians. Over the next couple of weeks, as I said, I'm going to lead you. It's a beautiful text, isn't that? From, we can't write like that anymore. Oh, only priests that lived 100 years ago write like that. Um, we're going to be um, spending the next two weeks making that pilgrimage with our Lord um, as best we can from here in Annandale and to walk with him, to go to the Jordan, uh, to the baptism of the Lord, and to see what happened there, to ask where he went after that, what he did next and why. What was his ministry in Galilee all about? These are the questions we'll be asking, and I hope the questions we'll be answering. There is no easy answer, I said, because the Gospel writers were not writing as a modern-day historian would write. They were writing to prove a particular point, to show an aspect of the life of the Lord. And so every single story was not important to, to them. And the same stories were not important to them. So you do have to, as best you can, piece the story together from the various evangelists. Um, however, they are true. And by taking them together, I believe we can do well to piece together that historical narrative. Not perfectly, but well enough. Our purpose is to walk with Christ. To see Him as He heals the paralytic and drives out the demons to walk to the sea and get into his boat and go away to a lonely place to pray with him. Why Galilee? Why would God choose Galilee of all places? It is the northernmost part of the kingdom of David. I'll show you. Now, this, that's another beauty. I had to put that one up there because it's just so beautiful. 
Okay. <coughs> the Galilee is the northernmost region of, uh, of the kingdom of David, or the kingdom as they conquered it uh, with Joshua. Turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. Actually, there is the, t- there is the uh, screen I wanted to show you because you see, you've seen these slides before. You see Galilee there, Samaria, okay? I'm going to ask you just, we're going to look at, we're we'll probably going to look at this slide three or four times through the thing because I want you to get comfortable with it, okay? Here's the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River. Here's the Dead Sea and Jerusalem. I know you can't read that, but it's okay. Jerusalem's right there and Jericho is not too far from Jerusalem, In fact, you can stand on the top of the Mount of Olives and see both the city of Jerusalem and the River Jordan. Okay? You can see all the way down into the valley. So, open your Bibles and Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. There's two texts I want to show you. There are two times in which Jesus goes into the region of Galilee both for different reasons, but both related in some ways. We're going to start, what did I say? Verse verse 19. There you go. This is after, uh, this is when they returned from Egypt. And and, uh, of course, after the slaughter of the innocents. Verse 19, But when Herod died, when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus reigned over Judea in the place of his father Herod. Now, what's Judea? Judea is this region just south of Samaria. Okay, it's the, it's the original allotment. In fact, if I go back, it's the original lo- allotment of the tribe of Judah from which the kings came. So they controlled the land around Jerusalem. Okay, so Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great. And I want you to know the Herods because you guys know Herod was there when Jesus was born, right? He ordered the slaughter of the innocents. We also know that Herod was there up in Galilee. We also know there was a Herod there when Jesus was tried. Huh? Pilate sent him over to Herod. These are different Herods. But how many of us know who they are? Okay? It's very confusing, and I want to try to make sense of it to you because it will assist you in understanding what's going on in Galilee and why Christ is doing what He's doing. Okay, Archelaus reigned over Judea in the place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he, he withdrew, Joseph withdrew, to the district of Galilee. And he went and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. A Nazarene. Well, what does it mean to be a Nazarene? And what prophets prophesied that the Messiah coming would be called a Nazarene? Well, there's no easy answer to that question. Matthew certainly understands that there is a relation between the Messiah and those dwelling in Nazareth. But there's no prophecy that says he shall be called a Nazarene. And so we've got to dig at that a little bit. This, this is the first text that, that brings our attention to Galilee. Jesus heads up here with Joseph into this upper region. Okay, uh, And the second time that we hear of Galilee as Jesus' place where he goes or enters into uh, is found in um, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. So take a look. It's right there in front of you. In fact, if you come back to chapter 3, verse 16, you'll see that that end of the text is the baptism of the Lord. Do you see that there? Okay, he was baptized. So in in chapter 4 then, he comes out of the waters of the baptism and the beginning of chapter 4, he immediately goes into the desert to struggle with the devil. Okay, the devil tempts him. You know the story well. Come down with me to verse 12. 
Verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, Jesus withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum. Capernaum. Literally the town of Nahum. The town of Nahum. We don't know who the Nahum is. It could be the prophet Nahum that lived there. Okay, But Capernaum will become Jesus' uh, home. This is where he will uh, center the launching point of his ministry. Okay, Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. That was that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So now we have a second uh, prophecy or a second attempt at quoting a prophecy, which again Matthew does from memory and leaves us uh, hoping we can find the text. We will be able to find this one. Verse 15, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali toward the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region, the shadow of, de- of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Both of these texts that Matthew quotes. Both this text about the Nazarene, although it's not explicit in the Old Testament, it's still there. And this text now, he's quoting here, both come from the prophet Isaiah. So I want you to turn back to the prophecy of Isaiah with me. Isaiah is super easy to find because he's, um, he's got, he talks a lot, kind of like I do. <laughs> or God talks a lot through him, which, yeah. Makes him very different than me, I guess, in very many ways. Chapter 9, okay. Uh, chapter 9. In fact, we'll look at chapter 8. I'm just going to give you a co- touch down a few verses just to give you a sense of the text of the prophecy. When is Isaiah prophesying? Does anyone know? What's the answer? When did all the prophets prophesy? Come on, don't be afraid. During the Babylonian exile, exactly. Well, before the Babylonian exile, and during the Babylonian exile, and after the Babylonian exile, because we've got crisis going on all over the place. So all the prophets are sent during this time. Isaiah is prophesying during the reign of Hezekiah the king, one of the righteous kings who reigned just prior to the Babylonian exile. Okay? Uh, Hezekiah was the one that tunneled underneath Jerusalem. Some of us have walked through his tunnel before. But he's prophesying, and notice what he says. Um, uh, I'm just going to just grab some verses. So chapter 8, verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 8. And it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. And come down to verse 10. Take counsel together, but it will come to naught. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. What's he talking about? He's talking, you're counting me down, right? He's talking about, he's had a vision of a river coming in from the north and swallowing up the promised land. And what is that river that's going to come in and swallow up the promised land? The Babylonians, exactly. But notice what Isaiah says in verse 10. You, take counsel together, but your counsel is going to be for nothing because God is with us. Uh, That same text is quoted referring to Christ in the the, uh, narration about the nativity of the Lord. God is with us. We spoke about that on Gaudete Sunday. You'll remember Chapter 9. But there will be no gloom for her that was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in latter times, he will make glorious the way of the sea. If you're, if you're highlighting underline, write that down. The way of the sea is a, is a place. It's a technical uh, phrase to identify uh, a, a road. Okay? Uh, nine one at the end of nine one, right? Yeah, yeah. The glorious, the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Notice, uh, we heard Galilee of the Gentiles. Now we heard Galilee of the nations. The same thing, okay? 
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has shined. For, on them a light has shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, thou hast increased its joy. They rejoice before thee as with the joy at harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Come down with me to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, and upon, uh, no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth forever. Sounds, sounds pretty good. Huh? It's a prophecy. Well, we can get in maybe during Q&A of what he's talking about historically at the time, what's going on. But also now this is used, picked up by Matthew, of course, and used as, as a prophecy for Christ. And for his entrance now into Zebulun and into Naphtali. Who are Zebulun and Naphtali? Sons of? Sons of Jacob. Very good. These are two of the twelve sons of Jacob whose name became? Israel, right? And it's his name which is then lended to the whole land of Israel. And you know when they came into the land after the exodus and they conquered the land, Joshua divided up that land into the different tribes. So you see Ephraim, God, uh, Reuben, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali. These are the sons and ultimately two grandsons of Israel, right? Joseph, Joseph receives the land in his sons, okay? Um, in his two sons. So, and of course, Levi. Does Levi receive land? No. Does he receive land? No. Ah, Levi receives the land of lands. He receives the centerpiece of the entire puzzle. He receives the temple. That's his land in the midst of Jerusalem. Okay? All right. You can pick that up, Genesis 29 and 30, if you want, the division of the land. We don't need to go there. Um, and I, I said slide of division of land, but I think I'm good. Uh, in Joshua 19, I'm sorry, in Genesis 29 and 30, are the two sons are mentioned. In Joshua 19, in Joshua 19, you don't have to turn there. You'll have the story of the division of the land into these areas. Okay, you'll see sometimes Dan is is right down here. Dan should have been up here, but he was too chicken to go and get it. So he ended up carving out his piece down here where he wasn't supposed to. So sometimes you'll see Dan here, and sometimes you'll see him uh, right up there at the top. But the point is that Zebulun and Naphtali, notice where they are. Naphtali is the, the very the northern tip, the very northern tip. And Zebulun, and that's not the only reason why they're mentioned. They're also mentioned because of that phrase, um, uh, the way of the sea, the way of the sea. There is a road, a trade road, which comes in here, really following, if you want to go all the way from Babylon, all the way over, following the Fertile Crescent and dropping down right here through Naphtali and Zebulun. Okay, we'll have a chance to look more closely at that. Galilee, the term Galilee is first used in Joshua chapter 20, verse 7, at the allotment of the land. And again in 1 Kings chapters 11 through 12. No, I keep it to Joshua 20 verse, 7, 20, verse 7. In 1 Kings chapters 11 and 12, you can turn there. 1 Kings chapters 11 and 12. Most of you should know by now. How many of you have done salvation history with me before? That's it? Oh, Lord, I think it's time to do it again. Yeah. That's, that's not good. We've got to do that again. Um, well, then I do have to tell this story a little bit, but I don't have time to spend much, much time on it. In chapter 11 of 1 Kings, you'll see in verse 26, a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, uh, was a, a, a strong leader in the court of King Solomon. 
Okay? And um, the prophet Abijah went out to Jeroboam. And because of the sins of Solomon, I know we think great things of Solomon, and he was a great man at different points in his life, but at other points in his life, not so well. And he had done some things which were quite bad. He built temples all the way up the Mount of Olives, overshadowing the temple of the Lord. Uh, He had, what, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Um, Yeah, not a good thing. Um, (laughs) And at this point in the story, Solomon's kingdom is about to be taken out of his hand. In fact, he will die before it's taken out on the account of David and, and the holiness of David. The Lord waits, but he won't wait long for Solomon will die and Jeroboam will rise up and split the kingdom in half. Well, really, he'll take most of the kingdom. The northern ten tribes will go with Jeroboam, and the southern tribe, Judah, uh, and basically Judah's left. Simeon's not here anymore. Judah's actually conquered him. Um, Benjamin's gone. So he's just one kingdom left, left down there, controlled by the son of Solomon, and the rest of the kingdoms split and break off. It's not too long after that that these northern ten tribes will be conquered by the Assyrians. And you can see that in 2 Kings. Turn there with me. 2 Kings chapter 15. 2 Kings chapter 15. Verse 29. 15 verse 29. 2 Kings, not 1 Kings. 2 Kings 15 29. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon. And the rest of these places, and notice what's on the list. Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. And he carried the people captive to Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah and the son of... And so forth. The story goes on. What did the Assyrians do? The Assyrians conquered the north. The Assyrians were ruthless conquerors. What they would do is they would conquer a place. They would take all or most of the people out of the land. And they would take people from other places and bring them in or repopulate the land. Why? Because they don't know the language. They don't know the, the gods Okay, in those times. Uh, they don't know how to, where to get out, where the food is. Where, it's not an easy life. And it's easy to keep people like that under control. And this is exactly what the Assyrians did. Those those people brought with them um, all their pagan gods. Okay, and I thought I had the text there for you. Oh, look at it's right there. Look at chapter seventeen, verse twenty-four. That's the text I really wanted you to see. Chapter seventeen, verse twenty-four. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Zephyrvaim. And place them in the land, the cities of Samaria, instead of the people of Israel. Samaria is the name given for these northern ten tribes at the time. Okay, So he, they repopulate the land, leaving some of the poorest people of the land, but bringing a whole bunch of other people in. And so the people began to intermarry with the pagan Babylonians and all these other people that were brought in. Okay, Now we can start to understand what is going on in the gospel text, when we hear Galilee of the Gentiles, a people that was in darkness, a great light has shone upon you. The kingdom had been split from Judah and from the rightful descendant of the throne of David. If the kingdom of David was ever going to be restored, those northern ten tribes had to be retaken and reestablished under the dominion of the king. And this is where the story in the gospel becomes critical to understand Naphtali and Zebulun. If Naphtali and Zebulun begin to see a great light, if they begin to come under the king again, then the split in the kingdom, which was really at the background of the entire destruction of the conquering of, by the Assyrians, the conquering by the Babylonians of Judah, the burning of the temple. And this was still in the forefront of the people's mind as they were preparing for the coming of the Messiah 
500, 600 years later. They knew if the Messiah was going to come, he had to go and restore this problem. Why did Jesus go to Galilee? He went there for a purpose, to reclaim his rightful territory as king, as king of the people of God. Archaeology has shown that after the Assyrians conquered the north, the area of of Naphtali and Zebulun, and ultimately uh, the town, the city of, um, of Nazareth, the town of, of Nazareth at that time um, was emptied. And you can show from archaeology that when they were conquered, they, they did not repopulate the town of Nazareth. In fact, it probably was not called Nazareth back then. It was a very small place. Maybe 120 or 150 people at most lived in that town. I want to share with you then how it came about that there was a town reestablished there in the north at the time of Christ. I'll read from Dr. Carroll's book on history of the time period. He says that it was during the five-year unconstitutional reign of Marius in Rome that the long life of John Hyrcanus, son and successor of Simon, the last of the Maccabees, drew to a close in Judea. John, again, who's John Hyrcanus? He is the son of of the last of the Maccabee brothers. You know the story of the Maccabees at the end of your Old Testament. This is the son who inherits the throne. They had retaken it, huh? but then they began to make pacts and covenants with the Romans, with the foreign governments. God told them not to do that. Okay, John Hyrcanus had extended the Maccabean frontiers substantially while maintaining his position against the weakening Seleucid rulers and occasionally defeating them. In the south, he had conquered Edom, obliging its people to accept Judaism and its men to be circumcised. The first forcible conversion on a large scale in the history of the chosen people. It, we, it was because of this that Herod, an Edomite, was born a Jew. In the north, in the north, John Hyrcanus conquered the Samaritans and destroyed the separatist temple they had built on Mount Gerizim, probably soon after the death of Alexander the Great. He was regarded as a friend of Rome, and there many have been, and there and there and there may have been more one or more direct Roman interventions on his behalf. But despite John Hyrcanus' success, there was a growing concern about the faith, about the faithful, sorry, I apologize for reading this poorly, growing concern among the faithful about the union of the office of high priest with that of ruler of the people of Israel. No such union had ever existed before. In 104 BC, so 100 years before Christ, John Hyrcanus died and was succeeded by his eldest son, Aristobulus I. Josephus tells us that Aristobulus immediately imprisoned his mother, who was starved to death, and his three brothers, one of whom he soon killed. So had the Seleucids treated their own, not the glorious Maccabees. Aristobulus reigned only a single year, but during that year, he took Galilee from the Seleucids, reuniting it with the domain of of Jerusalem for the first time since the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to the Assyrians in the year six or 617 years before and forcibly converting its non-Jewish inhabitants as John Hyrcanus had forcibly conver- converted the Edomites. Okay? So here, a hundred years before the coming of Christ, this area which had, been, had become pagan was conquered and forcibly taken, reconverted, and put under the dominion of Jerusalem. Okay, Why is this important? Because now Jews can go there and live there in safety, whereas they could not before. And there began to be populated in the towns that had formerly been there, groups of people that came back from Babylon. They had still, groups were still living in Babylon. And at that time, archaeology can show that Nazareth was repopulated. Okay, a hundred years before Christ. 
It would be just a few generations after John Hyrcanus that we come to know of Herod. Herod's father, Herod the Great, Herod's father's name was Antipater. He was the counselor to the descendant of John Hyrcanus. Herod killed the reigning Maccabean descendant. He also murdered his father and was established by the Romans as king of the entire Holy Land. As he drew to his death, as he drew to his death, while Jesus and the Holy Family were in Egypt, he appointed his three sons to become rulers in his stead. Herod Antipas took Galilee, and I believe, well, I've got a few pictures of Galilee here for you just to give you a sense of the beauty of the land. Okay. Herod Antipas receives Galilee. This is uh, Herod the Great's youngest son. Okay. Herod Philip II receives this area called Betania across the Jordan. So I want you to see this that the Jordan's running right up here. Okay. But it also runs north of the Sea of Galilee and it creates a natural uh, border. So one of his sons, Philip II, receives this area. And Archelaus, who we heard Joseph did not want to go into his area, right? He was the oldest son. He was probably ruthless like his father. Controlled this area until 6 uh, six AD. But he had ruled with an iron fist and was finally removed by the Romans. And the Romans stepped in and created this area as subject directly to them. And appointed a governor over that land of which Pontius Pilate would be one of them eventually in the year 26 AD. Okay? So the land is divided up into these, into these three sections. We can see this in Matthew chapter 2. So turn to Matthew chapter 2 with me, and then we're going to have a little fun in the New Testament here. So you see in chapter 2, verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Which Herod is this? Great. Herod the Great. This is the father of the other Herods, right? Okay, of Herod the Great. And notice when he was in Judea. Judea is this land which is the center control piece and he controlled the whole business which would then be cut up among his sons. You can see in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Come on, turn your Bibles with me if you have them. Chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. Huh? This, this is one of his sons, Herod Antipas. Okay, did I mention his name to you guys? Okay, Herod Antipas. This, this is the Herod which will be at the trial of Jesus. And he controls Galilee. And it's fundamental to understand it. This is the Herod that arrests John the Baptist and takes his head off. Okay, he was a son of his father. Okay, and notice who else is mentioned in this text. And his brother Philip the Tetrarch. Now, who do we know? What do we know about Philip the Tetrarch? Where was his wife living? With Herod Antipas, right? That was the whole situation of why John was preaching at him. And Philip's controlling this area on the other side of the Jordan River. It's going to become critical to our story. Okay, and you see also in, I should have had you turn there before, but Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 19, which is the text we had read uh, before. But I hope it will make a little more sense to you now. But when Herod died, that's Herod the 
the great died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, this is Herod Archelaus, reigned over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Okay, And again, he will eventually be removed, and there will be a number of descendants to, the, to govern that land, including eventually Pontius Pilate. Okay, all right, take a look with me at Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14. This is the text of the arrest of John, and it will make a lot more sense to you now also. At that time, at that time, chapter 14, verse 1, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is... He said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these powers are at work in him. For Herod was, had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Okay? And this is Philip, Herod Philip II. Okay? If you can make sense of that one. All right. And then finally, take a look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Okay, this is the trial of Jesus. When the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found the man perverting our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. Okay, they're lying about Jesus. But come down to verse 5 with me. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all of Judea, from Galilee even to this place, even to Jerusalem. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was, from, uh, was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, this is Herod the Great? No, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. When he, was, he's, when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at the time. Okay? Why? He's like, thank God I don't have to deal with this, right? Send him over to this other guy. He's got to deal with him. He's his subject. All right. Now we can step a little bit closer into the story. Okay, Matthew chapter 4, verse 15. And I know we're seeing some text twice, but it's okay because I think it helps us to kind of understand what's going on now. Remember, it was at the end of chapter 3 that we saw that Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized. And when Jesus was baptized, the gift of the Holy Spirit descended upon Him. It was His royal anointing as King. And Jesus will leave from this place on the Jordan River and He will take off to restore His kingdom. Okay, It's fundamentally important that you know that the baptism Lord, all of a sudden, the story changes. Jesus begins His ministry immediately. And the first thing He's going to do is He's going to go after the devil. He's going to walk into the desert and He's going to conquer the devil who tries to tempt Him. You remember, the devil had tried to tempt Adam also with food, and Adam had fallen. So what did Jesus do when he was baptized? He went out of the desert and fasted for 40 days to get himself nice and hungry. So as the devil looked at him and saw a man who was weak from hunger, he would go after him just like he had gone after Adam. I believe that Jesus was setting the trap. And as the devil stepped in, the Lord knew he was going to conquer him. He went out into the desert for 40 days, was tempted by the devil, and immediately coming in from that temptation, we hear that text in verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, no more. You have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, those who had been conquered by the Assyrians, had been estranged from Jerusalem and from the rightful descendant of the throne of David, a light has dawned upon you. I hope that helps make sense of the situation. 
a second layer. A second layer now. And in the region of Galilee, the town of Nazareth. It's much debated. It's much, much debated what that title, uh, the Nazarene, meant. But I have a book with me that I, from a man I'll, I will be quoting from quite a bit. In fact, I'm using most of what I'm saying from his book. His name is Bargle Pixer. He's a priest. Bargle Pixer. The last name is P I X N E R. He has two great books. Uh, with Jesus through Galilee and with Jesus in Jerusalem. Okay? It's excellent. And this is what he has to say. The, f- the findings of excavations in Nazareth allow conjectures that Nazareth was uninhabited during the Persian and early Hellenistic times from the 8th to the 2nd century BC. The lack of any Assyrian. Persian, and early Hellenistic ceramic points to a long settlement gap. This absence was confirmed uh, to the author by a man named Bagatti, the excavator of Nazareth, shortly before his death in the autumn of 1990. One can surmise that this gap filled when a group of the Davidic Nazareans clan settled in the deserted village as immigrants from the Babylonian exile, seeing that the, Dave, that, that the David family of Nazareth, as portrayed by the evangelist, did not only consist of the Holy Family, but also of other clan relatives. One may well take it for granted that most of the inhabitants of Nazareth belong to the same extended family, that is to say, the clan of the Nazarenes. Why is that important? Why is that important? I'm going to turn back, and you don't have to do it with me just for time's sake, to Isaiah chapter 11. You can write that down if you like. Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, we read this prophecy just two chapters after that text about Zebulun and Naphtali in chapter 9. This is chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot... Literally in Hebrew, a natsar, a natsar, a shoot from a branch from, oh, I'm sorry. There shall come forth a shoot, a natsar from the stump of Jesse, and a natsar, a branch, shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. This was a prophecy that they waited to see fulfilled, that those which came from the, the line of David, as the author conjectures, would have been called huh? those branches which came forth, the Nazars. And when they came to this land, established that city which had laid vacant, the town of Nazareth. It makes a lot of sense when you understand this in the context of Matthew chapter 1, as he starts the story of Jesus with the Davidic genealogy of Jesus Christ. And when Joseph came back from Egypt and he knew that Archelaus was controlling this area, where else would he go but to the other place where he knew his clan, his family members, his cousin, his extended families were living in the town of those who were the offshoot of the stump of Jesse, those who were of the Davidic line waiting, waiting for the Messiah to be born from them. And that is where Jesus went up to Nazareth to fulfill that prophecy that he should be called a branch or a Nazarene. Okay? So, let us go to the baptism of the Lord in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Really, the story begins in chapter 19 as the Pharisees come and say, Are you, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah who is to come? And notice where John was baptizing in verse 28. Chapter 1, verse 28. This took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Okay? Now, where is this location? It's right here near Jerusalem, right at the top of the Dead Sea. 
Okay, here's a little close-up of it. Here's Bethany beyond the Jordan. You'll notice these tributaries to the Jordan coming in right there. You guys see those little blue lines coming in? Little tributaries. John was working this whole area and baptizing people. People were coming out of Jerusalem from all over the place and meeting him here. Okay, the place is still known today where our Lord was baptized. It was preserved by the early Christians right there at the, where the Jordan has those tributaries washing into it. And you can still go to it today. If you thought the Jordan was some beautiful crystal clear river, you got another thing coming. It's a muddy old creek. And then, but it is the source of life flowing from the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea. Okay, and there's a little more beautiful spot on the river, but it's not, this is not where Jesus was baptized. This is where the Protestants help have people go, but it's well known that this is not the location where Jesus was baptized, okay, even though it is more beautiful. Okay, this is the original location. You have Jordan on one side, you have, uh, you have Israel on the other. The baptismal site is right there. You can see it right now. Being, it's, there. it's being developed right now because Pope Benedict went down there. It had been closed to the Christians. The Jews wouldn't let us go down there. And finally, they opened up because Pope Benedict did his work. And it, you can go down there now and go in. You can't go beyond this border because if you do, you go into, the, into Jordan. Okay? You can't cross. It's the line between the two countries. And so guys stand there with, uh, you know, well, you know. I always wanted to jump over that stick and go on to the other side. But anyways, and here you, see, here you see the two groups, one the Jordanian and one the Israelis. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what that looked like and that, what the Jordan River looked like. And you'll notice it's just right up north. It's no more than five miles from the top of the Dead Sea, about five miles or so, to that traditional site of the baptism. And notice also how close it is to Jericho. Why is that important? Because when Jesus walked out of the Jordan River and went into the desert to be tempted, he went right into Jericho. And you can go to that place today. There's a massive cliff and a monastery built upon it. I should have put a slide up here, but it's a little bit beyond our story. Okay? And Jesus will then make his way up uh, into, into Galilee. Okay, let me find where I am in my notes. Look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. Um, chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. Why would he be down to Capernaum? Capernaum's up north, isn't it? Capernaum's up here. Capernaum's up on the Sea of Galilee. Why do they call it going down? Because the closer you are, you always go up to Jerusalem. And the Jordan River is here closest to Jerusalem, right here. Okay? So you always go down and away from Jerusalem. Okay? Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. You'll notice at the top in Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Chapter 4 verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit for 40 days into the wilderness. Okay? And we come then now down after that temptation to verse 14. And Jesus returned in power of the Spirit into Galilee and report concerning him went out through the surrounding countries. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Where did he go when he went up to this region of Galilee? Well, Jesus is about to stand up in the synagogue in Capernaum, all right, sorry, in the synagogue in Nazareth. And I've got a slide to show that to you. He's about to stand up there and proclaim really what was the rightful thing of only the king to proclaim. And when he does so, we're going to come down to verse 20, um, verse 20, um, verse 23. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here also in our own country. Huh? So we know that Jesus, coming out of the Jordan River, headed up into Galilee, began preaching in their synagogues. Well, where are their synagogues? They're all over the place, okay? But we now know that prior to Jesus going back to Nazareth as, uh, as a young man in the first year of his ministry, he went first up to Capernaum. 
Turn back with me then to John chapter 1, verse 43. That's what I wanted to read you, yes. John chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. This is now, again, just not too long after his baptism. Okay, Jesus decides to go into Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Okay? Why is this important? Where are they from? Where does it say they're from? Bethsaida. Bethsaida. And where is Bethsaida? Bethsaida is right here. Okay? Sorry, I'll do it with my things so some of you can see over there. Okay? Bethsaida is right up there, right next to Capernaum. All right? So we know, how is it they found each other? I was thinking this as I was reading the text. How did they go and find each other? His buddy went and Nathaniel went and found his buddy. Or Philip went and found Nathaniel and so forth. How did they find each other? Yeah, this is a, you know, this area is quite small. You can walk from Bethsaida down to Capernaum in, in, you know, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. Okay? This was where they fished. They all hung out together. They were buddies right along the sea. And it's a very small area, which I'll be showing you in the next few minutes. And this is a key turning point. That Jesus is the anointed one of God. Jesus is the Christ. He is the king. Now he is going to reclaim his kingdom. This is why he goes to Galilee Galilee to minister. To reunite the kingdom. To claim dominion from the devil who he has just conquered in the desert. Jesus is going to go out and begin his ministry as king. And as king, he has dominion over his kingdom. And his kingdom is not simply uh, ordering this, this thing or that thing, this person to do that or this person to do that. Jesus is going after the fundamental root problem that the devil had dealt to us in the first place. Jesus is going to go and exercise his dominion over those he created. And when he see pe- sees people that can't walk, he's going to make them walk. When he sees people with demons dwelling in them, he's going to cast out those demons. When he sees people drowning in the waters, he's going to reach down and grab Peter's hand and take him back out of that place of death. Go back with me, finally, to chapter 4. We're almost done here. I know, Monica, I'm over time, but I'm the executive director and I get another minute or two. Um, What did I say? Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Well, go back to verse 14. And Jesus returned in power and spirit into Galilee, and a report concerning him went out through the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Again, he went into Bethsaida, he went into Chorazin, he went into Capernaum, all there around the Sea of Galilee. And now, and he came to Nazareth. Nazareth is right there, not too far uh, distance, probably a few days journey. Okay, a few days journey. He goes back to his hometown. He goes into the synagogue in Nazareth. You can go there today. Uh, I I want to show you guys that. Bethsaida, okay, Capernaum. um, Tabga's right down in here. This is where Mary Magdalene lived. It's all walking distance area and very beautiful. And he's going to come up here through the hills, okay? He's going to make his way over to Nazareth following this red line. What is that red line? That is the way of the sea. Come Exactly, coming all the way down along the Fertile Crescent. All of the travelers came through this area, and it connects Galilee up to Nazareth. You can still walk it today. He stood up in their synagogue and he said in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent... I wanted to get it there. There's Nazareth. 
I wanted to show you the synagogue. There it is. Okay, very small. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery to the sight of the blind, to set up at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and wondered at the gracious words which he proceed, that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, right, to a pagan. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, a pagan. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city. They led him up to the brow of the hill on which their city was built. And they, that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through their midst, he went away. And look at verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching. Now, I'm just going to run through a couple slides because it's critical for you to see this. As you come down, this is the plain of Ezra and all of the great armies of the world march through here. This is that highway of the, uh, the way of the sea. It's the great battlefield in the Holy Land. If you come down from this and you turn just to your left, you're going to see the, um, the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor. Here's Nazareth. Here's the mountains we're looking over. Here's Tabor. And you go right past Tabor to go back to Nazareth. And that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to follow this way of the sea back up to the north. There's Mount Tabor. And this is that, this is that plain that you're looking at. Um, Na- uh, Capernaum's going to be right along that road there. And this is the valley. It's called the Valley of the Doves. It was the valley that Jesus walked through. And that's the Sea of Galilee. Okay, and here you have the Valley of the Doves opening it up to the sea. And I want to show you this, and we're going to, we're going to stop in just, I promise, in just a second. Okay, but this valley is critical when you're on the sea because you can come back and you can see it from the water. That's the view from the Sea of Galilee looking back now, looking back towards Nazareth as Jesus would have come down there. That's the pathway. And Jesus is going to come down here now. Right along here, he's going to come to Capernaum, and, uh, and we're going to pick up the story there. But I'll show you that right here now, within do- walking distance, Mary Magdalene, the calling of the apostles at Tabga, Capernaum, all within 15, 20, 30 minutes walk from each other to Bethsaida. This is where Jesus lived. It's where he camped. That's where he healed and where he drove out the demons. This is where he climbed, again, up to the Mount of Beatitudes. Capernaum is right there. We're going to read next week that he's going to go up on the hill and teach. That hill is right here overlooking the Sea of Galilee. His whole ministry will be spent either here or in Jerusalem. And that is the place where he called the Twelve Apostles. We'll stop there and we'll pick it up next week. Please, in the meantime, you might thumb through your Bibles this week and kind of try to find your way so it's not all brand new to you. Um, A couple quick announcements, I do believe. Yes, there is a stack of Dr. Cuddeback CDs, the four-set CD on um, on, uh, the Summa Theologica. If you want those, those are out for you. And uh, we'll be back together next week, same time, same place. And then Brendan McGuire will be with us for the baptism of Clovis. Um, we also, by the way, you see we are going to the Holy Land. If you do want to go, don't wait long to sign up. Okay? You don't want to be like 20 people behind and hope you might get in. Okay? We'll take a short break and we'll come back together for a little question and answer if you like those that like to stay around. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Yes.
Would you speculate on whether or not Joseph chose Nazareth by accident, or was he consciously choosing to fulfill the prophecy? Right. So that's what I'm saying, is it, that uh, I was trying to make that point, that he certainly, oh, as far as fulfilling the prophecy, eh, I don't know about that. However, however, I will say this, that um, I do believe that, that those who established the town of Nazareth were descendants of David, and they were his brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts, and uncles living there. Um, uh, it makes a lot of sense. There's all sorts of other evidence this has happened in other places also, that their name, uh, they took a name from the Old Testament, where their name, uh, their, their family name became the name of the town. Um, that even happens, even happens today. Um, but I will read you also a quotation that I skipped from, uh, from Josephus. Josephus, um, says, I'm sorry, not Josephus, Eusebius, in his work on the history of the church, says, Few in antiquity have thought it worthwhile leaving personal memoirs in that they had records or drew the name from memory or from some other archival material in order to preserve the memory of their noble birth. But among them were the already mentioned uh, uh, despocin, despocin, I'm sorry, I don't know Greek very well, Desposinoi, the Lord's people, so called because of their relationship with the Savior's family, originating from the Jewish villages of, Na of Natsara and Kokaba, they spread out over the rest of the country. What's, what, if that doesn't make sense to you, what he's saying is there was a group of people, and there's other accounts of this also, there were a group of people that were, came from Nazareth, Okay, and called themselves Nazarenes, root the the root people or branch people, branch people. Okay, right. So they, it was known that they that they took this name for their clan and also claimed relationship with Jesus. So there's this there's a there's too many connections to re, to deny it that Joseph certainly didn't just head up there to some place. 120, maybe 150 people lived there. So it's not like you know, heading up out of Egypt, it was a well-known place to go, like a major city or something, right? He went up there intentionally, and I think he went up there because that was his family's town, right? Well, I was just going to ask, I was just going to ask, um, isn't that where they came from to begin with, before they even went to right. Bethlehem? Right. They came right. from Nazareth, right. exactly. yes. so they just went back home. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But the point is that there's a, there's a bigger issue of whether whether he's going there as a single, right, it's just his family going up there, or if there's a bigger issue of the members of the Davidic family and Davidic lineage going up there and establishing a town and calling it the name directly from Isaiah chapter 11. Okay? And then that would make sense of Matthew's text, he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay? Um, you were talking about the end of the Maccabean kings and how they kind of reunited Galilee and Judah. What was the nature of that reuniting if Jesus was still called to Naphtali and Zebulun at the beginning of his ministry? What's the nature of it? What do you mean? Well, obviously it wasn't completely separated anymore as it had been previously. So it seems like it kind of changes... Jesus' role as to less of a historical reuniting. And, it had already been reunited. Right. Right. No, it's true, but the prophecy is being used in relationship to Jesus because there's, yes, they've been, the Maccabees claimed it, grabbed it, established, right, and then, and then towns started popping up of Jews. But now what Matthew is saying is that, hey, you guys up in the north that had gone into darkness, had gone into paganism, all that, a, there's going to be a light shining in your midst. So yes, the Maccabees had come and retaken the land physically, but Jesus' kingdom, I'm glad you asked this question, Jesus' kingdom is not going to be about uh, worldly politics. Jesus is going to go and exercise his dominion in a different way. And this is why I wanted to call the talk driving out demons. Jesus' kingship is a matter of reclaiming his kingdom, and his kingdom is, is us. He's reclaiming his creation, and that's why he's going to come up there and intentionally he's going to go face to face with the devil, number one, 
And number two, the consequences of the devil, and that is sickness and death. And you watch, he's going to walk right into the synagogue in Capernaum, and the first person he's going to meet is a demoniac. And he's going to walk out of the synagogue in Capernaum, and the next person he's going to meet is lying on her deathbed, is Peter's mother-in-law. And the next person he's going to meet can't walk anymore. And they're going to drop him through the roof into Peter's house. Okay, so to understand why Jesus is doing this is extremely important to understand. It's right after, right after his baptism. Okay, and then he goes to Nazareth and proclaims that beautiful text of the proclamation of the good news, which we talked about on Gaudete Sunday, the proclamation of release from slavery. And the release from slavery that Jesus is going to give is a release from slavery to the devil. I want to ask a question about this wasn't uh, coming from Nazareth wasn't a good thing for all the apostles because the, one of the apostles says can, can anything good come out of Nazareth yeah. and and then Jesus turns it turns it around and says I, I saw you under the tree right. and so uh, um, the fact that and wasn't the the, the Naphtali were they were the first to come back from captivity yeah no Naphtali and Zebulun. Yeah. First come back? No, no, no. They had been conquered. Naphtali and Zebulun. No, they also the first come back. No, Naphtali and Zebulun were, let me go back to that, that area. Naphtali and Zebulun were, never came back. The, the entire northern tribes had been conquered by the Assyrians and had never returned from Assyria. Some of them were left there, but they had been inbred into the people. Um, so, yeah, right up, well, whatever, right up in that area, as I was showing you guys before. To come, and you're right, to come from Nazareth, it's, it's, it's not known. It's not known except by the people who have established it, the Nazarenes, those who are of the Davidic line. It's not some great city like Jerusalem to stand up and proclaim his kingship. And that's the point. He goes back up there and he's living among the people who believe from them will come the king they will reestablish the kingdom. And it's beautiful then that Matthew chooses this text out of Isaiah to tell us exactly who this person is and what he's going to do. He's going up to that northernmost region, that first place which fell to the Assyrians, and there he's going to proclaim his ministry of conquering the devil and driving out the consequences of what the devil uh, gave to us, right? Death and sin and all of that. You have an online... I'm sorry? Exactly. And from that darkness now, it'll shine throughout the whole of the Holy Land. This is from Bill. In John 1, 28, we read, John was baptizing in Bethany. However, isn't Bethany on the back side of the Mount of Olives? To what is John 1, 28 referring? There's, there's two Bethanies. This is Bethany, quote, beyond the Jordan. Okay, Bethany, you're right. We've talked about that in our Jerusalem uh, series that there's Bethany right over, we've, some of us have been there, right over the Mount of Olives. But this is Bethany beyond the Jordan. That's its name. And you'll notice it's not very far beyond the Jordan. It's right there. Yes. Lazarus was right outside the Mount of Olives, right right there. Yeah. We went there, didn't we? Oh, we didn't go there. Yeah, yeah. you got to come back. Okay. So... I was completely taken back by the beauty of that synagogue. Uh, is um, a lot of the architecture that way? And some of me wants to say that Jesus was probably a, uh, a bricklayer to build something like that. Well, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, Bob, but the, the, the synagogue that you saw there, which now I don't know where it is in my, my slides. I'll take a guess. There it is. Yeah, I want to know about that. Okay. This, by the way, I'm going to show you. This is the um, Church of, of the Annunciation in Nazareth. Okay, so in Nazareth, is that what I said? In Nazareth, and there it is again. You can see it. I, I put this isn't a good picture, but you can see the hill country, right? The mountainous country, and is there a hill country there also? Okay, now this is the synagogue built on the pattern, on the very floor pattern of the original synagogue in which Jesus preached. So when you go there, that's the size of the synagogue. Now the walls here are later, I believe, Crusader construction. Okay, and there's a church on top of it. This is underground now. Okay, one last question. Okay, Ian, 
It's very interesting about Nazareth being a specific place that they reestablished, but he was not uh, bringing his, his apostles as he was cho- choosing was, were not Nazarenes, but they, I think, are fully Jews. So is there evidence that other complete Jews, not the ones, had also gone up there and were yeah. establishing themselves there? Yeah, exactly. So the whole area now is being populated. It's now 100 years since the conquest of uh, the Hasmoneans. So they go up there and now they're re coming from Babylon, coming from all sorts of exile, right? Even down in, in Egypt where they had gone during the exile. And they're coming back and they're looking for land. Where are they going to live, right? And they're reestablishing their, their centers, their, their, their homes, Okay. All right, thank you guys for coming very much. I hope you come next week. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ's church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.